All right, we're ready to go, guys. All right, welcome everyone. We're gonna uh, take a couple more minutes and let people come in uh, to the Zoom uh, room. Thanks for joining us this evening. It'd be great if folks can uh, type in the chat where they're Zooming in from. Um, as I understand it, this is a Connecticut wide event. So it'll be wonderful to see um, what corners of Connecticut people are chiming in. Lots of West Hartford representation. Manchester. California, yay. Atlanta, wonderful. New Jersey, Wisconsin, West Hartford again. Boston, New York. It's amazing how the world of Zoom has enabled many of us to come uh, together in ways that wasn't as possible before. That's the silver lightning, um, I think, of this era. Welcome from Stanford. All right, so one more minute waiting for anybody else to hop in and then we'll get started. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. I am Sahar Amjad from the I'm Not a Virus program. Thank you again for being here. I also wanted to extend a huge heartfelt thanks to our co-sponsors, CT Humanities, the CT Historical Society, and Yukon's Asian and uh, Asian American Studies uh, Institute. I also wanted to thank our community partners for all of their support for sharing this event and the film with all of their members. The film, absolutely fantastic, by the way very emotionally moving, so incredible. And I think the theme that I personally kept coming back to was this idea of community and how that can span across not only an entire country, but across the world and what that looked like between the black, Asian and white communities in Mississippi. Um, and it was just so moving and incredible. And I think that we have the trailer here now um, to show to everyone. Growing up, it was always kind of a mystery about my dad and his side of the family. Whenever my brother and I would ask him about my grandfather, he would just say, oh, it's a sad story. It's, it's not a big deal. One day we came across this photo of a gravestone, and that's when my dad finally told us that this is where my grandfather and great-grandfather were buried, but not in China, in Mississippi. Chinese people in Mississippi? What happened there? actually don't know where we are going and where we're going. Last thing I thought I'd ever find in Mississippi was a Chinese museum. I guess there was more than just my grandfather and my great-grandfather. When the Chinese first came to the Delta, they were treated like we were. Everything was very segregated. I mean, it was black, white. We were just really in the middle. 
I had to attend a segregated one-room schoolhouse. Growing up, I read about segregation, and I, I thought that it only affected the black community. I just didn't really think that it would happen to the Chinese, too. What? Great-grandpa. I knew all your family. It is so important for people to know what happened with the Chinese Exclusion Act and how it affected Chinese Americans throughout the nation, including the South. Thank you for sharing that. But that was the introduction to uh, our film. And now I'm going to introduce our moderator, Dr. Quan Tran. She is a senior lecturer in the Ethnicity, Race, and Migration program at Yale University. And she teaches courses on critical refugee studies, comparative ethnic studies, and food studies. Dr. Tran, take it away. All right, thank you, Sahar. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, as Sahar mentioned, I teach um, in the Ethnicity, Race, and Migration program at Yale. And part of why I pursue an academic career um, has to do with the fact that my family came to the U.S. as political refugees from Vietnam about 28 years ago. And ever since, I have, you know, um, spent much of my time researching and piecing together stories and experiences um, that have been fragmented by migrations and historical silences. And on that note, the film Far East, Deep South deeply resonate with me on so many different levels. Um, and I'm thrilled and honored uh, to moderate tonight's discussion with this um, wonderful group of panelists. Um, and the film, you know, the, our conversation um, will be about the film, but also um, making connections to local Connecticut stories, right? And thinking about um, how uh, the stories that are being told in, in Far East Deep South can also resonate with our local Connecticut contexts. Um, and so uh, among us tonight, um, in terms of the panelists, we have Larissa Lam, uh, the director of Far East and Deep South, Baldwin Chu, the film's producer and one of the uh, main subjects, Adrienne Billings-Smith, um, a local Connecticut attorney, flight attendant, and founder of Concerned Parents of Color of West Hartford, Professor Jason Chang, a historian and activist from UConn um, and the Make Us Visible uh, CT campaign, and Kate Lee, a middle school educator and board member of the Immigrant History Initiative. Um, so at this point, it would be lovely if each of the panelists could please share a little bit more about yourself. Um, give us a quick sense of what you've been up to. So why don't we start with Larissa, then Baldwin, um, Adrian, Jason, and Kate. Um, hi, everyone. Um, we are zooming in from California. We're in the Los Angeles area and uh, we are married in case. Oops, I'm disappearing here. The virtual background. Uh, we are married in case you didn't know that. And um, we have been promoting Far East Deep South and we appreciate all of you who've been watching it. Um, if you haven't seen the film yet, um, it is still available on PBS World Channel or World Channel until June 3rd. So um, and, and if you want to share it with your friends, um, please do. You want to say anything, Baldwin? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Baldwin Chu, the uh, producer of Far East Deep South, and the, our family, my family is the subject of the film, uh, married to this wonderful uh, lady right here. Um, she is a director because she likes to tell me what to do. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, we're, we're happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Welcome. Adrian, go ahead. Hi all, Adrian Billings-Smith here, um, local parent um, and attorney, um, activist, founder of Concerned Parents of Color of West Hartford, um, also activist in residency at uh, UConn for the history department. Um, I am just here because I was moved by the film and the similarities between the, the Asian American and African American experience. 
Um, and I am so happy to be here to be discussing something so pivotal about our history and actually having a moment to speak about local history because I think it's so important to the national dialogue. Thank you for having me. Okay, everyone. Jason. Yeah, thank you, uh, everyone, for organizing this and participating, sharing your evening with us. Um, yeah, my name is Jason Chang, and um, I'm a prof uh, professor at UConn, and I teach immigration history, um, Asian American history, and um, also like history of the ocean, which is super fun. Um, I'm going to be diving into that into my summer courses shortly. Uh, but this. Um, Past few months, we've been embroiled with uh, trying to pass some legislation in Connecticut to bring Asian American studies to our public schools, and um, and also uh, just building um, interracial solidarity locally to to build uh, you know the capacity for uh, for you know uh, for justice work, and um, and so you know we think that schools are a good place to start, uh, and you know one of the things I love about this film is that uh, it brings, you know, it shows the, the importance of, uh, you know, people's stories, even when they think that uh, their stories don't matter. Uh, and, you know, in the way that, you know, when we share things that that opens up opportunities for other people too. And then, and, and that's why we're here. So thank you, Larissa and Baldwin. Hi, I'm Kate Lee. I'm an educator here in Fairfield County. I teach middle school Chinese. Um, in addition, in my capacity as a board member for the Immigrant History Initiative, we work together in creating anti-racist curriculum um, for students, parents, and educators to use. Um, in addition, I'm also part of the Make Us Visible campaign. I work with Jason along with Mike Keo and Jeff Gu in hoping to pass legislation that will center um, Asian American studies in the classroom. Well, thank you all for, for uh, the brief introductions, and I hope that you'll have um, opportunity, we'll have opportunities to elaborate on some of the incredible work that you're doing. Um, tonight's discussion is framed around the idea that there is no national history without local stories. Um, and one of the key themes in Far East Deep South is the quest for an origin story that can anchor one's sense of belonging amid larger forces um, of displacement, erasure, and movement across borders. So on that note, um, I'd like to begin the conversation with a, a hyper-local question by asking each of you um, if you could speak a little bit about your origin story, right? Um, how far back can you trace your ancestry and your family's arrival um, to the United States? Well, ours is a little obvious if you saw the film. So uh, <laughs> we'll just uh, say that my family has been in this country for six generations. And then going back to China, your family um, is from the village of Sunwoi. Um, and we've only traced back, let's see, you've got six generations, I think, five or six generations that we've, we're able to trace. Um, and then for myself personally, um, I'm actually half Shanghainese and half Cantonese. Um, my dad's side of the family is from a region, a southern region of China, uh, Zhongshan, not too far from Su Sunwui. Um, and then my mom's family is from uh, Shanghai. My grandfather was from uh, Suzhou, and my mother's side was from Ningbo. I don't know how many generations I can trace back. I just know my mom. My mom knew her grandparents, so that would be my great grandparents. So I can stretch back that far. How about you, Jason? Yeah, um, let's see. I think, um, I mean, we have records of, um, of my dad's side, my Chinese side, uh, going back to my great grandfather who immigrated to, uh, to Hawaii. Um, and of uh, and a European side that's largely Irish. And, um, and I think we have records maybe five generations immigrating almost at the same time, but the opposite coast. Um, and um, and um, one of the interesting things about my family's, uh, my Chinese side in Hawaii is that I'm, I, I was born in Indiana, but I was the first uh, on that side to, uh, to be born a US citizen because my dad was born in Hawaii before, uh, before statehood. Um, and so, uh, you know, even though being here for four or five generations, uh, you know, it's only, you know, that the fan that we have 
one you know born in a, a natural citizen. Um, so you know it gives you a sense of not only the racial bars to naturalization, but also the colonial territories of the United States. Thank you, Jason. How about you, Adrian? Um, <laughs> my story is a little different, right? Um, I can trace mine back to Alabama and Tennessee. So to my great, great um, grandparents on both sides of my family and maybe one more great. Um, my, like I said, my story's different being an African-American um, in the United States. Uh, we don't have the, the documentation that allows us always to trace beyond our, our quote unquote American heritage. So, um, I know where my, my family reigns from as far as in the Americas um, through 23andMe, I found out some of my, my background, um, you know, my genetics, so to speak, of what coast of Africa, the parts of Africa I come from, but uh, that's as far as it goes back for, for myself. And uh, that's why I, you know, love the story because it, it allows us to see how important that history is and archiving those experiences are for not only Baldwin's family, but for, for Black Americans' families who need to have that history also documented in order to um, continue the process of, of, um, of the American, uh, American history experience for all of us. Thank you, Adrian. Um, how about you, Kate? I was born in San Diego, um, born and raised in San Diego, California. Um, my parents both came to the States in the 80s from Taiwan. And beyond that, um, you know, I hear some stories sometimes from my grandpa on my mom's side. Um, and then recent years, um, my mom has shared some stories um, about more details about my grandparents' journey, my grandpa's journey in going from China to Taiwan and how there was permanent separation of family there. And um, this is kind of where, when I watched the documentary, there were certain parts that echoed stories within my family and this hesitancy in unpacking it um, from the older generations. And um, I think this is something that we're gonna continue to learn more through over the years to come. and. Um, after I watched this particular documentary that night, I FaceTimed my parents and talked about it and hoping that I could lay some groundwork so for some um, future conversations to dive a little deeper into our family's history. Well, thank you all for sharing with us, you know, your incredibly diverse um, stories and backgrounds. Um, it goes to show, right, that all of us are Americans, but we each have a different pathway, um, our families have a different pathway to this country. Um, Baldwin and Larissa, um, it was the, the desire to explore and connect the different fragments of the Chu's family history that led to the creation of this film. So could you please talk a little bit about the process of making the film um, and what were some of the challenges that you faced? Yeah, well, first of all, it wasn't supposed to be a film. It was supposed to be just a family video you know um and we had no idea what we were going to find we thought we'd be lucky to even find the gravestone and if we did then we captured that on video maybe put some flowers on it and um, pay our respects and, and maybe that was it um, then we found all that stuff that you saw in the film and larissa had she had uh, other ideas about what we should do. I, I honestly thought we were just taking a family vacation. And then the moment we stepped into the, the Mississippi Delta Heritage Museum, that's where the wheels I think started turning because I just couldn't believe that there was a museum in the middle of Mississippi with all these Chinese families um, documented. And you know, we all learn about the American South in, in our history classes and segregation. And nowhere did I ever realize that our community um, 
were impacted by this. And so I just had this just very visceral experience walking to that museum. And, you know, it, it almost feels like that cartoon where you have the light bulb go off all over your head. I mean, I felt like that was one of those moments. And, and it, it made me question, it's like, well, why don't we know this? Like more people need to know this. Cause if there's a museum here, that means, you know, we're not just talking about two people. I literally thought we'd only find Baldwin's grandfather and great grandfather and to find thousands and generations, you know, that were there that lived and died. Um, I, you know, I, I really wanted the other people to know about this story. Um, and certainly the biggest challenge for us was not, I mean, we didn't know um, what we were going to find. I mean, the first trip that you see in the film, that was that was after we, we went through our first trip and it was really less than 48 hours that we found all that information. Um, you know, we put together a short film called Finding Cleveland um, about five years ago. And at that point, we had so many questions and so many people had questions for us that we decided to make the, the feature length um, documentary Far East Deep South that you guys have seen. And for that, I thought we were done filming. Um, I remember 2016, October, there's a shot of Baldwin walking through some cotton fields um, at the end of chapter two. And I thought that was gonna be the end of our film until I ended up having to create a chapter three because we ended up at the National Archives where somebody, when we were in New York one time said, hey, have you seen the Chinese exclusion files for your family? And we're like, what are those? And we had no clue um, that there were these files there that you see in the film. Um, so that changed my whole film. And that was probably one of the biggest challenges because I thought the movie was going to be just about the Chinese in the South. And then it all, all of a sudden it became so much more and it became about heritage. It became about lineage in the United States. It, it became about discriminatory law, laws and immigration. And so um, the story kept getting bigger and bigger. And um, hopefully we put together something that was, that, that was coherent. Well, it was, it's great. And I, I think there's such an organic uh, evolution to the film. And I'm so happy to hear that it was actually an organic process, right, in, in thinking about how to develop this film and the various twists and turns that your journeys had taken you. Um, Baldwin, this is such a deeply personal story um, for both your dad and for you and for your family. So I was just wondering, how did the absence of a father figure in the film, you know, in, in your dad's life, um, impacted the way that you were raised? And how did the process of making the film revise your understanding of your family history and your relationship with your dad? Um, but also your dad's relationship with his father, right, and grandfather. Um, so if you could elaborate more, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, first off, I think he might be watching. <laughs> <laughs> I think he is. I saw. I, I saw him. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, certainly, we when, when I was growing up, I mean, there was definitely a generational difference. You know, I was kind of like, I mean, I thought I was the first one born here in this in this country, and so I was very, very much Americanized. Um, my dad, I mean, I guess after after we finished making the film, I had a better understanding of why he did. Um, certain things, you know, obviously he didn't have um, a role model to, to, to kind of figure out how to be a father. And, and, and even, even today, I mean, you look at most fathers, like myself as a father, I, I don't know what I'm doing, even though I had a father that, that modeled it for me, right? So, I mean, I think as I got older and, as, and, and now that I've seen um, the consequences of what the Chinese Exclusion Act was and how it separated our families, I, had, I have a better understanding and a deeper sense of, um, I mean, I, I'll even say forgiveness, you know, like, you know, the, the things that me and my dad kind of fought through, uh, I, I think I understand a lot more and I can, I can forgive and, and say like, hey, I understand why things are a certain way. And I think when, when he found out that his father actually loved him, uh, I think that was a big turning point when you saw in the film because um, his entire life, he just figured his, his father abandoned him, left his family in China. You know, he was enjoying the great life in the land of opportunity and in Gold Mountain, you know, and they just left the rest of the family behind and he's out having fun. And that wasn't the case, you know, and, and so he spent his entire life probably trying to forget that, um, that, that missing part of his life. And then when we brought it all back to light in Mississippi, and when we made those discoveries, finding, you know, finding the letter that said he actually loved my father, uh, I think, I think that really probably tore him up a little bit, you know, and even today when he watches the film again, um, he gets reminded, um, it doesn't, it doesn't take away or doesn't return back his 75 now, you know, 80 uh, plus years without having a father, but at least now he has some closure 
and some understanding that he wasn't left behind on purpose or abandoned. It was a system that nobody quite understood. Even today, we don't quite understand the repercussions of that system, you know, no, the Chinese Exclusion Act, on um, how it separated families. And, and now he, he understands that. And I think that's helped our family. Yeah, thank you. I think in some ways, right, um, the film is recuperating um, all of the characters in, in the stories. Um, and, you know, in, in it opens up a um, different way for us to revise and rethink um, our narratives of, of people in our lives, right? Um, and how that is connected or not connected to broader stories um, in, the, in the social and political world. Um, Larissa, as the film's director and also a member of the Chu family, um, I, you know, you mentioned earlier that there were just really a, a process of one surprise after another, right, um, that helped shape the film's narrative structure. Um, but I also know that you are um, a filmmaker way before the, this film. So I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about how did the process of making this film um, has changed you as a director um, and how you know, it, it helps you think about um, the ways in which one can tell stories through documentary filmmaking. Yeah, well, actually, I was a music uh, artist and music composer before I became a film director. And so the short film, Finding Cleveland, that we mentioned about our first trip was my first film dir dir directing experience. Um, I had directed and written plays in the past and had produced some television and music videos and short form videos. Um, but certainly taking on Far East Deep South, uh, a feature length, um, was way more challenging than I anticipated. Even with the short film, I think we took like five months to, you know, make that. And, you know, you think like, oh, well, it's a little bit longer and, you know, maybe it, it'll take a just a little, like twice as, it'll just be twice as hard to do a feature length. Now it was like 10, <laughs> 20 times harder to do a feature length film, uh, maybe even like a hundred times harder <laughs> um, because there were a lot of elements to balance. Um, one of the things, I mean, I think from a storytelling point of view um, is character. I mean, you mentioned that like characters are important and the people in our documentary, um, they are characters. And so I looked at them that way in the sense of, we had so many interviews um, and it's even with the family, like where do we start and really honing in on the father son relationships throughout the film. Um, was I think very key that I, I, I kind of liken it to I, I decided to ultimately it was like Baldwin and his dad are on a road trip you know that formula right like they're on a road trip it's like a buddy it's not quite a comedy but it's uh, this emotional journey where they take together where um, they're kind of at odds in the beginning and, and the end um, they come to a place where they're drawn closer together um, and so that was kind of the the journey that I, I, I put the, those two on I mean it happened naturally but as a director um, you kind of have to edit it and and piece together the pieces to make sure that story gets told. And it's definitely harder than um, you know, people realize. And then also the history, like the history aspect was very difficult to balance. Um, you know, if I just done had just done a straight you know, historical documentary with just talking heads, that probably would have been easier. Or if I just stuck with like a family observational documentary, that probably would have been easier. But I decided I wanted both elements because to me, both of them were very important. Um, the family journey and also the history that was discovered. And so the decision was also made to tell and, and discover the history through the family's eyes. So um, we had so much more history in an earlier cut, um, but it was just overwhelming for, I think for the audience, overwhelming for the audience. And so we wanted to make sure that um, the audience could take in every little bit of new information and process it. Um, and so we did it really through the family's eyes. Oh, that's wonderful. And I think it's, it was very well balanced, right? Um, and I think the tension between right, the individual story and the kind of larger framework, historical framework that one needs to understand um, is very well woven into the, the film. Um, and so uh, and the, the, it's really nice to also be able to hear kind of like the backstory of how the film was made, right? And, um, and the ways in which it evolved over time. Um, at this point, I'd like to you know, pivot the conversation a little bit um, to address some of the broader themes in the film that also that the film also touches on um, and connect them to some of the local stories in Connecticut. Um, one of those themes is, connect, um, is the discovery and recovery of histories and experiences that have been marginalized. Um, and just like the stories of, of uh, Baldwin's family and the Chinese American community in the Mississippi Delta, 
Uh, there are compelling stories that are waiting to be told about Asian Americans and other communities of color um, in Connecticut. Um, and one of them uh, is the little known story about Asian immigrants and the tobacco industry in Connecticut. Um, and this is a, a work that Jason's currently working on. So Jason, could you please share with us your research on this history, um, but also speak a little bit about the sources um, that you have found that enable you to piece together the story um, and any parallels that you may see between your project um, and Far East Deep South. Mm, yeah, uh, this is such a lovely conversation. Thank you uh, again. Um, and actually, I'm looking at the, the movie poster on your digital background there, Larissa and Baldwin, uh, with the lone person standing in the field. And um, that, in a way, serves as a metaphor for how I came to this project, because I read Ocean Bong's On Earth Were Briefly Gorgeous, which is, uh, which is a, you know, a autobiographical and uh, discusses his life growing up in central Connecticut and as a Vietnamese refugee. And, um, and a third of the novel takes place in, uh, in tobacco fields. Uh, and you know, so for a casual reader, uh, it might seem very odd uh, or kind of um, idiosyncratic, but it's a very Connecticut story as I found out uh, that, you know, that um, tobacco shade growers have been uh, bringing workers uh, to Connecticut for about a hundred years. And, um, and so one of the parallels that I see in this, in this project is uh, the way that, you know, the, that people's, uh, that migrants' fates aren't determined by the forces that bring them to a certain place to work, right? And so, you know, similarly, you know, while people were brought here to, uh, to work, that their lives weren't shaped just by that work. And, um, and so, you know, I think this provides us with a really wonderful blueprint to, you know, be curious about, about those absences and, uh, and to look into those. And the thing that is often, you know, what, one of the magical parts of this documentary is, um, is the way that communities become these alternative archives, uh, you know, that the, the archive itself, it often just has traces. Um, and, um, and when we look at, um, at some of these, uh, the experiences of people of color, of migrant labor, um, you know, that, that often the records are from state sources or from governments or, you know, some kind of office that is in some way, uh, you know, an agent of racialization for that individual. And so the records that we have are often you know, these kind of uh, singularities around the racialization of a particular population, say the hundreds of, uh, um, uh, um, of Jamaican uh, workers, you know, the, the passenger manifests I found of them and, uh, and their worker contracts or the Puerto Ricans who came up. Um, but what we don't have, what, what, what these government archives are really terrible at is getting at the interracial uh, and, and mixed realities that many of these people lived in. And so, you know, we really have to look at alternative sources to get at what those, what those other stories uh, can, can hold. And, uh, and I think it's, you know, it's through, um, it, it's through telling stories and having a, a, a common space where we do that. Sometimes those are museums, uh, sometimes they are community spaces, uh, like this, uh, sometimes they're in murals, right? So people can can share that kind of individual story that is a, a, an allegory for a, a larger community. Um, and um, and so I, I think one of the things that happens with um, uh, in with tobacco labor here is that because it's it's always about uh, the sort of disposability of the labor because there you know there's just a need for the harvest and the curing process, and then that labor is supposed to disappear, right? And this is a cycle that's happened for over a hundred years in Connecticut, in the Central Valley here. Uh, and you know, often all we have uh, are these red drying barns uh, as fit, fit, as kind of anchors in, in the landscape, and we hardly ever see the workers, right? Um, so in some ways, I feel like 
telling their stories is in some ways a form of reparations because we are repairing the past or we're repairing uh, you know, to hold that space so that people can fill it with their lives and all the various connections, um, you know, that, that, that made their, their life here rich, you know, beyond just their exploitation as workers. Um, you know, they also fell in love and they also uh, had parties and, you know, celebrated the things that, um, that, uh, that gave them meaning. So, um, so, you know, we, we don't really have a choice of, of, uh, where or when we're born, uh, but we have a choice about how we relate to the past. And I think, you know, when, we, when we're curious like that and um, uh, we're not satisfied with, uh, with sort of easy answers. And, you know, I think that just leads us to building community because those stories are embedded in, in memory. Wow, thank you, Jason. It's, and, you know, I think the, the connections that you're drawing for us um, from your work in, in connection to the film uh, really speaks right to the notion that you were all sort of entering the story midstream, right? Um, we, we kind of got plopped into it, into the world. Um, and how I, I like how you, you pose it as, right? You, you, you can't choose how, when you're born and where you're born, but you can definitely choose how to relate to the past. And that initiative comes from both uh, within yourself, right? Um, but also in relationship to how other people are relating to you. Um, and I appreciate that. Um, and then your discussion of sources also made me think about, you know, it's not just what history is not yet being told, but also if they are told, right, how are they being told and by whom? Um, and the juxtaposition between what the state's historical archives can record um, and with, you know, in relationship to what personal archives, the community archives um, can offer um, is a great reminder that right? there's not any singular narrative, but in fact, we kind of need um, multiple narratives to, to be uh, in conversation with each other, to fill each other out, um, and to point out also the kind of contradictions that exist um, in historical past and even contemporary moments. Um, so in the film, I was particularly struck um, by how in order to tell the stories of Charles um, Lowe and Casey Lowe, the Chu family had to go out um, you know, to Mississippi and beyond um, to find and weave together so many different strands of perspectives um, from local and national archival materials to personal scrapbooks um, and recollections of individuals who happen to know um, these, these uh, protagonists, right? Um, and I think the, that's the reality for many of us um, whose families have experienced displacement and trauma and whose stories are often erased and remain fragmented, unspoken, and inaccessible. Um, in that sense, I really appreciated the collaborative and intergenerational attempt uh, from the film to confront such erasure and silence, right? Uh, so that brings me um, to our uh, panelist, Adrian, who is also confronting historical erasures, intergenerational traumas and silences um, in Connecticut when it comes to African-American histories and experiences. Uh, so Adrian, could you please elaborate on the collective and personal work that you are currently involved in um, and what parts of Far East Deep South uh, resonate with your work? Well, I would thank you so much, Quan. That part exactly that you speak of, of when they go and they start speaking to the community members to learn about Baldwin's family, about his father's family, hit me because that's the research that I'm doing here in Connecticut, um, that I'm doing with Jason and um, my intern Gia, um, other partners um, through the Connecticut State Library, um, is finding these oral narratives and making sure that we're, we're archiving them, making sure we're getting the stories that need to be saved because we have a lot of people who have photos, things up in their attics and their basements that they haven't touched in forever. And that's what you saw in the film. You saw people go and dig these things up and find the letter and find the pictures um, of Baldwin's grandfather. And those are the things we're looking for. And those are the things we're trying to archive 
um, here in Connecticut. Being from the South, um, as I spoke about earlier, and not having all those generations to go back, there's a lot of history in the New England area with, with Black families and um, that I've discovered. And I love learning about that because it gives it brings closure to, to me as, and as also the family. And I want to make sure that these families within Connecticut have that sort of closure. They know that they're at least a part of their history um, that's not being told to them through whatever history and, and educational spheres or, or whatnot. Um, and that's what my research is, is doing. We're going and we're finding these families, we're finding these names, we're making sure that they're being said, being researched. And as Jason and I always speak about, it's about even if we can just find that one family story that brings closure to so many generations of people who didn't know anything about their families or only knew a great, great. Um, and that's my goal. And this is going to be a years long project <laughs> because I, I really care about the experiences. And as I always tell people, local history is what makes national history at the end of the day. Local history is what builds our stories, builds up communities, gives people um, a window into what actually happened in, in, in their states, in their regions, in their um, cities, their towns. And it helps people to understand how their towns developed, how their, their families developed, why they're in a certain, why there's a certain family business, right? And that's what I loved about the film is that you got that history. There is a, a space for, for Baldwin's family at the grocery and everyone knew that grocery store. Everyone knew um, uh, that, his grandfather, Baldwin's father's father, owned this grocery store and they all were able to go there together. So you have these communities, you you go and, and someone said something about Southern history. I, I think of Larissa, what we learn about Southern history in our history classes, right? Segregation, this, that, and the other. But when you took those stories and you saw black, white, Asian families saying, yeah, I knew your grandfather. Yeah, I knew exactly what I did. Our family shop there, they were together. And that tells a completely different story than we all know when we hear about Southern history. We hear about the trauma, we hear about Jim Crow, we hear about the lynchings, but we don't hear about these, these communities these, that live together and amongst each other. And I think when we start to tell those stories, we can start to have some sort of healing in this country. Um, and that's why I appreciate this film so much, because to set that tone, we can start to have some discussions around what was what was really happening. We all know the lynchings were happening. We all know there was segregation. We all know now through your film that Brown v. Board of Education affected not only Black Americans, but Asian Americans and other um, Americans of color. And we don't learn that at any point in our in our history we don't learn how many communities are affected by one singular piece of policy and i think that you did such a beautiful job because it gave me more motivation to continue on with my research to ensure that these stories are being told, ensure that we're getting up in people's attics, ensuring that things are being archived, ensuring that our children know what happened in their generations before them so they can take that on. So thank you so much. Well, Adrian, um, that was really powerful. And I think, you know, the, the work that you're doing um, is doing that part of restoration, right, um, of, of Connecticut history um, and restoring complexity to that story um, and elevate voices that's just been um, excluded. Um, and in that sense, you know, your comments made me think um, about the, the emotional and the intellectual labor um, that is required for the tasks of preserving knowledge and making sense of the past. Um, another big theme in the film that, that stood out to me is this intersection right, between local and national histories and how they influence individual and community experiences. And, and Adrian, you mentioned this, right? How can um, the, a legislation like Jim Crow um, law affected so many communities? And if we 
are only looking at that story from a kind of top-down perspective. We lose out all the nuances. We lose out in the different ways in which people navigate and negotiate, right, on their everyday uh, living um, environment. Um, and this resonates with what Jason was mentioning earlier, right? The state can only give you, you know, statistics or uh, the state's version of why these workers are here, but it doesn't tell us how these workers um, in, in the tobacco fields are relating to each other, right? How do they form communities with each other? Um, and so, you know, one of the things that um, remains uh, you know, a, a part of the, com the larger conversations that we're currently having is the absence, right, of um, all of the histories and experiences of minorities in the United States um, in our K through 12 education, um, even in our college education, right? So unless you, you specifically uh, study or seek out Asian American studies or ethnic studies courses in, in college, um, it, you know, it's, it's not a part of, of your general understanding about the history of this country. It's not a part of your vocabulary to, to understand the nuances um, of, of the historical events that we, we tend to bullet point, right? And, um, and kind of corral into this, this impacts this one community, this impacts this other community um, and, and not seeing the connections. Uh, so I wanted to um, ask Kate um, in this sense, right? that um, the work that you're currently doing um, in bringing these kinds of stories uh, via Asian American studies to the K through 12 education context in Connecticut, um, how do you think the inclusion and the integration of ethnic studies in general can help us learn more about ourselves and connect with each other? Thank you for that question. Um, you know, what children need and truly even adults is just to be surrounded by mirrors, right? And right now, specifically in the state of Connecticut where the Asian American population is, I think 4%, even within that scope, thinking, it about, thinking about how many teachers our Asian American students have that look like them, that number is even smaller, right? And so if we don't have mirrors in faculty or peers, then we should at least, at the very least, have mirrors within our curriculum. And there's this, there were many parts throughout this documentary that resonated with me deeply on a personal level. But as a teacher who teaches middle school students, you know, fifth through eighth grade, that's a time when students are trying so, so hard to fit in and not stand out, but still try to figure out who they are, right? Um, and there's this moment towards the second half of this film where Stan Lu says this quote, about not really feeling proud for being Chinese. And the moment he says that, I had to stop and pause the whole thing just because I realized this man has been removed from that particular memory of being a secondary student for decades. And yet still he can remember that feeling of not being proud, of being othered, of feeling shame, potentially self-hatred, all the way back as being a child. And this is something that's not a singular experience. It's not an experience unique to him. It's one that I believe every student of color has experienced not just once, but, but several times, um, not just from K through 12, actually in college and in adulthood as well. We might have better coping mechanisms. We might not. We might not really do the unpacking until way later on. But if we can get ahead of it earlier and have students be proud of their ethnic and racial roots at an earlier age, that exponential growth in terms of self-love and pride for who they are will just have such a surge in self-confidence. And then it just causes this great positive ripple effect for our community, right? And I think in providing mirrors, this is where we also are able to kind of step into each other's shoes. Right, learning that the multiple narratives that Juan mentioned, we're all, they're all intertwined in some way. And we cannot look away. We cannot look away and choose to ignore everyone's stories, right? And if it takes so much work to find out our roots and to go into our attics, as Adrian said, then we need to continue preserving these memories and have them embedded in memory, right? Um, and I think this is where the development of communities and families, we don't realize just how much work it takes and how much intentionality it takes. 
Um, but really it's all rooted and anchored in compassion and kindness, meeting each other with open ears and hearts and souls and ready to come together to realize, you know, amplifying marginalized voices is not just for the marginalized community. It's for all of us. It's for everyone. Um, and if there isn't any negative to it, then why, why are we taking so long to get there? Right. Um, I just, I feel like for me, the education of our kids from K through 12, I think it will begin to solve a lot of the long-term problems that I think a lot of us have chosen to not look at or acknowledge. And I think we have an opportunity here, especially with this documentary, to amplify the message that we can do this and um, that everyone's story deserves to be discovered and found and valued. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, this is right such a, a broad ranging kind of work um, that needs to, to start much at a much younger age in a more holistic um, approach. Um, you know, and, and I think in some ways, when we think about, um, again, the story, including or integrating the stories of minorities in the US into mainstream curriculum, it's not about, right, um, you know, a hierarchy, creating a hierarchy between whose narrative is, is um, uh, worth mentioning or, or discussing, but it is about showing, right, the ways in which all of these narratives inform each other, right? All of these experiences are, are related to each other. Um, and it is only in that complexity, our understanding of it, that we can begin to deal with our complex society, right? Um, and, and kind of head off some of the, the tensions and issues that we currently are experiencing. Um, so at this point, you know, I'd love to have questions uh, from the audience for our panelists. Um, so I, I know that we are also live on Facebook. So if uh, I can't see that right now, but if um, uh, Mike and Sahar can feed me those questions, I'm, I'll be happy to um, raise them to the panelists. Um, and while we're waiting, um, I was just wondering, you know, in all of your work, um, this is for all the panelists, um, what are some of the things that people can do, um, right, to pitch in um, with the various efforts that you are spearheading? Um, whether it's through storytelling or um, education, right, or going out there and doing the kind of uh, grassroots work that Adrian's doing, right, looking at families attic, um, looking uh, at ways in which uh, stories that have not yet been brought to the fore. Um, so if any of the panelists can comment on that. Uh, we're Oh, here we go. Um, I, we're happy to jump in and, and share. Um, and we're so grateful for everybody's um, insight and you know contributions to to your community locally. It's so it is so important. Um, I always liken uh, this discovery of of this this history that has been hidden, or so many of these you know stories that have been erased and hidden, to like finding a family photo um, in an album that maybe the, the the photos corners had been obscured by some other photos that have been laid on top of it, and all of a sudden you open up the album and you remove those other photos, and you're like, wait, there 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 are, there are a few more other people, family members that we didn't know about that were here, and it wasn't like they came out of nowhere; they were there all along. And so, you know, we're not trying to replace that history or trying to like diminish another family story. It's like we're embracing family members that have been part of the family. And now we get to invite them to like family gatherings. And, and that's kind of like how we want to include this curriculum um, as Kate so, you know, put so lovely into our schools. And so that's our major effort right now um, with our film that, you know, we hope that um, if you watch the film, enjoy the film, um, you know, in our case, we integrate very well into existing history lessons because we talk about the American South. And, um, you know, we'd love to get our film into more schools. So if you have a school, if you, um, whether it's a university or whether it's a middle school or high school, um, please let teachers know um, about our film. And, um, you know, hopefully maybe we'll we'll collaborate with some of the folks here to, to do a workshop, a teacher's workshop of how, how we can best use the film in the classrooms. Um, um, in you know a new project down the line because I, I love this group I want to keep working with you all forever <laughs> um, so that is one of our major push um, for, for sure is to get our film into schools great thank you um, okay we did other folks want to jump in on that question or would you like to answer questions from the audience at this point because we do have one or two 
Okay, the silence means uh, we can move on to the audience. I was say something. In terms of contribution of what community yeah. members can give, I mean, I think um, it just, it depends, right? And on who you are. And, and I completely agree this film needs to be in every school. Um, but I think that you have to find your lane. I always speak about that um, and, and figure out how you can contribute to ensure that let's go for ethnic studies, that ethnic studies are included in our in our school's curriculum. That means making the phone calls, writing the letters, contributing the money toward the um, the policy or, or the, the campaign, I should say. Um, and I think as far as like on a grassroots local level, you have to do some of the same things because it's very hard to go into communities of color um, who, hold on tight. And I think all communities, right, hold on tight to their history and their families. And going into those communities, um, we have to have resources. How are we going to get them if we're going to do it at a community center where they're bringing their, their, their items? How are we getting them there? How are we ensuring that they're safe? Um, how, how do um, we get the advertisement out to them? So we have to be creative in the ways that we're getting these stories and finding the individuals to to give their narratives because at the end of the day we have to find those individuals who want to speak about their families to go and take you to their auntie to go and take you to their grandfather to you know to tell these stories and 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 getting the um the equipment to get there because you want some of this on tape right when you see i just um, I'm watching this documentary right now called High on the Hog, and it's uh, about Southern Black cuisine and how it's literally the foundation of American cuisine because Africa ends up bringing over rice that that is a part of South Carolina and all these things and getting those stories. He This man is going back to get all these stories, these generational stories of how these chefs are building community through food, and I think that's it. You know, and and working with Mike Keo um, and Jason and, and us constantly talking about building our our communities through food and history and art. Those are the things when we start to to delve into those things and get to know each other. We need everyone to be on board to uplift our communities, not not just of color, but specifically right now because we're talking about communities of color. We need people to uplift them in ways that they're traditionally not uplifted in, and and buy things and support them. So that's how I that's my spiel. Thank you, Adrian. Um, along that line, I think Adrian, your answer also helped answer one of the questions that um, uh, someone has raised in the chat is that how does one begin to trace their own heritage or lineage, right? You can begin by uh, something as simple as the food that is on, on your table, like, you know, asking questions about where it came from, how did it get here? And, you know, what, what is this story, right? And I think those kinds of organic um, ways into the, the, the narrative will allow uh, a lot of interesting and important discoveries. Um, there's also questions in the chat, right, about, uh, you know, how does one continue to contribute to some of the current efforts um, in advocating for Asian American studies um, in the Connecticut legislation? So maybe um, Kate and Jason, if you'd like to take up that question, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, I think uh, one, I wanna answer it first by sharing one of the images that I found in my research of um, some Laotian uh, tobacco workers, uh, which was very surprising to me. Um, let me see if I can make this work here. All right, can y'all see that? Nice. Um, okay, so there was a, a photographer um, who was documenting uh, this group of Laotian workers in um, uh, who were working on uh, tobacco. Uh, fields right off the Farmington River. And, um, and you know, to me, it, it just signaled this, um, uh, this deeper sense of what Ocean Vong had said in an interview about his novel, that he, he wrote it because, in part because he wanted to show Connecticut as an Asian American place. And I had never really thought about that kind of question before. 
Um, and if you've ever heard Ocean talk, you know, it's, it, it, um, he's very eloquent and um, uh, extremely insightful. And it struck a, a chord with me. And, and when I found, you know, so I started asking questions and digging and using the, you know, uh, the kind of um, sleuthing of a historian to, you know, Matt, you know, uh, try to think of the ideal source and then, and then try to, you know, seek out where that source might have ended up and be preserved. Uh, found this one at a tobacco museum in a um, newspaper clippings um, uh, binder. So, um, but one of the reasons why I think that's important is because it, uh, it demonstrates that, that Asian American studies is extremely diverse. And there isn't like a, it, you know, like Asian American studies doesn't come in a binder. Um, it's not something that, you know, it comes out of community, it comes out of sharing our stories. Uh, and, um, and Asian American studies is often, you know, it should be an expression of people coming together. And, um, and so, you know, I think because there are so many different ethnicities and we have so many different um, you know, immigration histories and ways of relating to the United States that, um, that just like a single unit on say the Chinese Exclusion Act may provide some you know, foundational kind of concepts around say you know, uh, racial management uh, through immigration restriction or something like that. Um, it's wholly inadequate for really understanding say the Filipino American experience and the relationship with US imperialism. Or you know, or the Southeast Asian refugee experience, um, or like one of our viewers who was talking about uh, Asian American adoptees, uh, you know. So in part, what I think people can do is to have conversations in your communities, um, to bring teachers, involve teachers, involve students. Um, you know, one of the things that has been so um, so heartbreaking about the rise in anti-Asian racism is that um, is that we're now, I mean, it's heartbreaking, but it's also kind of like, I feel some strength from it because people are voicing, telling their stories now because of they see that if they raise their voices and, and show that this is a problem, that people will start paying attention. And, uh, and while it's heartbreaking to find out all of these different ways in which anti-Asian racism lives casually in our day-to-day -day life, um, you know, those are also the reasons for particular forms of Asian American studies, right? That need, that, that work has to be done in those communities. And so, um, you know, I think what will make this legislation successful is having communities uh, be more active and invest in their schools, invest in uh, supporting teachers and, um, and, 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 you know, really educating the boards of education and, uh, and the districts to, uh, to show that this is not just, um, uh, not just equitable education, right, but something that will transform community, right? Because as we've seen in this, in, in, in this documentary, Asian American studies, this is something I hold, is a window into a broader kind of cosmopolitan interracial, you know, world that, um, that we really need that, that understanding, not just to share stories and, and share each other's perspective, but to understand the, the mechanics of power. Uh, and when we do that, we, you know, we won't be fooled by, um, by the kinds of you know race baiting and you know when when folks are familiar with conflict they know how to navigate it so we really need that uh, and a complex understanding of that Kate would you like to add um, some additional information about how folks can get involved um, in this sure. effort. Yeah, in terms of for the state of Connecticut, um, if you haven't already, feel free to follow us on Facebook at Make Us Visible CT. Um, that's where you'll get a lot of updates in terms of continuing the conversation that Jason just talked about. 
Um, I echo what he says completely. Start talking to people in your community, parents, um, students, alums, coworkers, um, teachers. Um, we're always looking for local champions and really it just begins in talking and listening um, and reaching out to your local reps, state senators, and um, tell them what you think, tell them what you believe in. And um, from there, we'll be able to continue this work together. Great. Thank you. Um, there is one last question uh, that I'd like to squeeze in and this um, from Elsie who asked, how do you feel about the relationship between Asian and Asian Americans and Black and African Americans today? Um, do you think that this film can help to improve them? Um, so if all panelists would take up this question and um, be great. Amazing question, Elsie. Um, you know, uh, Mike and I had this conversation a couple months ago when, when everything was kind of at its <laughs> climax. And um, we spoke about the, the tension between um, Asian American and African American, their, the relationship. Um, a lot of people don't know there's tension. Um, uh, they don't know the, 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 the real history about you know, the LA riots. There's things that people aren't aware of. They know there was an LA riot. They know there was a Rodney King, but they don't know what started this, right? They don't know what happened. They don't know about the little girl who's killed. They don't know these, these different elements to it, right? So, um, and we forget those things because we go about our day. Um, but there are, there are, our communities were put together, right? We, uh, when you look at the film, you'll see where they said, they couldn't be in the white community. They end up in the black community. Those are the the the, the majority of their their the people who shop at the at the um the grocery store, and they start to develop these these bonds because they have these um, similarities again in food. These similarities of how they they have learned to cook and prepare different foods. How they use their greens. How they use the pork. How they use all these things. So they end up in this bond together, not ever recognizing that that's what would, that would put them together or us together, I should say, I am them. So um, I think when we get back down to those minute things of culture um, and digging back into our histories and knowing how similar we are with one another, we can start to have those conversations about our relationship because what happens is, as Jason was talking about the race baiting, the pitting um, communities of color against each other, always, um, and Mike and I always talk about always making us um, fight for the same resources and not recognizing when we build a coalition together, we are stronger together in this fight um, against white supremacy. Um, those are the things I think about when I, when I watched this film, I thought these people are getting it. These people are oppressed. These people are being, have been put together in the situation. They have been forced through the, the Chinese exclusion act, um, through segregation and Jim Crow have been forced together because there are, there are points in the film where I'm waiting, honestly, for, for you to mention Larissa, where our families start to marry each other because they can't go home. So yeah. there's this entire African-American Asian community that comes out of the Delta also and goes up and migrates North that we have to talk about and why we have people that look the way they look because our families were, we were in relationships with one another. So um, when I think about the tensions and what's going on, I think we have to go back and really sit together, sit down as a community and realize we, we as two communities, when we're just talking about black and Asian built this country. It is on our backs and on our shoulders that this country was built. And we need to start to start to commune together and figure out how we become one again um, and, and fight these, these systems of oppression that are and, and, and violence that are affecting our communities. Yeah, I love what you said, Adrian. Wow. 
Thank um, you. We should take you everywhere we go uh, because, <laughs> because I think sometimes that's the hard part is if we talk to say a black audience and tell them, unless they've seen the film, but they've seen the film, it, it's a different conversation. But if we say like, wait, we, you know, we, we actually were in community together. And if they haven't seen the film, they're like, no, nah, yeah, that right. didn't really happen. It's like, ah, oh, you know, they, that, that's not, that's not true. You know, where I think we each have to advocate for our own communities. So, you know, the black community, those who are allies need to advocate um, for the Asian community and vice versa. And, and that's what we hope our film does too, because we understand like, especially new immigrants, um, they don't know the history of black America. They don't know the system of oppression and they don't even know the system of oppression for our own community here. And that's what we wanted to give in this, is, in this film is that sense for, for everyone um, to know that this is the history that was, and that's what connects us as well. I know personally growing up, I didn't feel a connection necessarily to the, the black American experience. Um, um, until I stepped into Mississippi and I was like, wait a second, we were there too. You know, I, I didn't have any idea. And, and I think those are friends of ours who are African-American. I think look at us differently now after seeing our film because they may have just thought like, oh, Baldwin likes to rap. He likes our culture. But he's like, <laughs> wait a second, his family's from the South, just like my family's from the South. And 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 all of a sudden that brings us closer together. Um, but there are they are difficult. Oops, I'm disappearing like a ghost again. Um, they are difficult conversations sometimes to have with people um, but we hope this film does exactly what you were saying adrian is that it, it provides a, a a common connecting point for all of us and with the the interracial marriages that is something baldwin asked about we actually tried to do some digging oh you want to talk about that baldwin uh um for the digging we were told that that was like a no-no to really talk about and it was it was actually kind of um it was, it was a tough one because you had two communities that were both marginalized. And then um, the, the, the complication is that with the Chinese Exclusion Act and some of the other laws, it actually, they said, you know, you're not allowed to marry outside your race, right? And so the whole point was that, you know, if Chinese people couldn't marry anybody else other than Chinese people, then they would probably end up being gone, right? So even, so, so that included marrying somebody that's black because then you'd have, you'd have a Blasian running around, right? And that still carries on your lineage. And so it, it got complicated and people were kind of in that area were kind of forced to kind of keep silent about it, both the black community and the, and the Chinese community. And so they, there are offspring that exist. Um, they, a lot of them are not in the region anymore. So we, we weren't able to track anybody down um, in our limited amount of research, but we do know those families. We've heard many stories that those families exist. And that is, that's a whole nother movie on it itself. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit to that, you know, because, you know, in, in Asian American history, there are these other examples of, you know, interracial, you know, solidarity and, um, you know, not only, you know, uh, Chinese grocers in the South supporting, you know, black sharecroppers uh, and, um, you know, but like uh, uh, Japanese Americans who coming out of the incarceration, incarceration camps after World War II, uh, finding you know, refuge in black communities. Um, and, um, and then also the African-Americans were you know, at, the, at the forefront in advocating for, uh, for Southeast Asian refugees you know, um, in the 70s. So, um, so you know, those, those stories are there. And I, I think, you know, as, as we alluded to earlier, you know, they're, they're also difficult to unearth. Um, but you know, we have to ask the question: Why are those stories so rare? You know, um, and that uh, we have to dig them up. And I think part of it is that is that we live in a violent country, uh, and you know, um, I think people just see that anti-blackness is is terror, um, and you know that that's you know for like we're saying, new immigrants that come to the country, they see that uh, you know what happens when you're driving while black talking on the phone while black, eating candy while black, um, you, you know, that these are, uh, you know, social scientists, anthropologists have looked at immigrant assimilation and they've long discredited the idea that there's a, some static American culture that, you know, that people, you know, uh, acculturate to. But uh, what, it, what often people find is that new immigrants assimilate to anti-blackness. Uh, and in some ways that is kind of a, a survival mechanism. Um, and, you know, so in, you know, what we've seen in this pandemic year is that, you know, when, um, when we 
stand up for, for black lives, um, that everyone wins, right? And that our oppressions are interlinked. And, um, and so, you know, I, I can't see, you know, a way of, of, of doing that work, you know, without, you know, really, you know, challenging the anti-blackness in, um, in the Asian American community and, uh, and, and building that kind of like, um, uh, you know, that, that your, your horizon, you know, of, of, of importance includes these other, it includes your neighbors and people who don't look like you. Um, and, you know, I think when we, you know, look at that kind of fight against white supremacy together, uh, and, you know, it really gives, you know, those kinds of bonds a lot, a lot more strength. Very well said. Um, and I think, you know, um, as, as time is up, uh, unfortunately, um, we'll have to wrap this discussion up, but I'd love to encourage our viewers and audience to check out um, all the work of our fabulous panelists. Um, and, and I truly appreciate the work that you all are doing and the spaces that you're creating, right, for communities to come together. Um, so please join me in thanking our panelists and our co-sponsors and community partners for making this event possible. And I hope that all of you who have seen the film enjoyed it. And if you haven't, please go see it right now um, and share it with other folks um, in your circle. And that, you know, you're also inspired, right, from tonight's conversation and from the film to ask more questions about your family histories and about the histories of the communities um, that you are a part of, but also the broader histories of our country. Um, so with that, wishing you all a great night and let's have some moments of um, solidarity that is already in the making and continue to be built as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Make sure you go grab some food with somebody. <laughs> <laughs> food diplomacy. Yes. Right. Go break bread and build some relationships. But I, I like your shirt, Baldwin. Yeah, oh, I, yeah. Like, I like to eat and dim sum too. So come on over. Let's go have some dim sum. Awesome. <laughs> Are there any good dim sum joints in, uh, in Connecticut? Connecticut? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. Space. No, space. No. That's one, and it's near the casino. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah.